So uh, we're here to talk about BitSwap, mostly like a little bit historical context and like where it really should go. Uh, mostly this would be a Q&A. I don't have slides. Uh, I don't really even have a prepared presentation. Uh, for some history here, uh, BitSwap is, is the thing we use to transfer data around. The most advanced implementation is the GoBitSwap implementation. Um, it's the one that does the most things. It's the one that's hacked on the most. It started the story of BitSwap was it was written. Um, the first version was, was kind, of, kind of dumb. Uh, it basically asked everyone for everything. Um, and predictably, you had like 20x wasted bandwidth or something like that. Uh, and the more people you're connected to, the more bandwidth you wasted, and this became a big problem. So the story of BitSwap really is the gateways are already down, let's fix BitSwap. And that has been happening repeatedly over time. Uh, so the, the, the problem with this, like that being the driving factor means like BitSwap or the Go BitSwap implementation has a lot of patches and has been modified over time in a hurry to try to fix things. Um, which means like it had some architecture and then it kind of lost it and it had another architecture and then kind of lost it and all these kind of glommed together. And now like in theory, there's some nice async things that are just held together by like global locks. Um, uh, and it has a lot of problems because of that. Um, so this is one of the main reasons it needs to be rewritten. The other part is like no one in, is entirely sure um, like how peer selection really works right now. Um, like how you select which peers you ask content from and all this kind of stuff because like it's like, they just had multiple people work on it over time without enough knowledge sharing. This is where we have the session. Um, uh, and honestly, without enough time to actually finish up what they were doing because they got pulled up with something else. So yeah, um, the, basically BitSwap is this, so uh, we talked about this last night uh, and actually the best way to describe BitSwap is like, it's the, the protocol you use if you don't know what your data is, you don't know the structure of your data, you don't know the size of your data, you just need it. Someone says, give me this CID. And you're like, okay, I'll find you that CID as fast as possible. Um, uh, it's also really useful like if you need to like download from multiple peers um, and you need to like quickly pull in like data in parallel from multiple sources that might have limited bandwidth. Um, and again, you just don't really know where to go. Um, the, the, the core of the protocol is, so for people who don't know, is like uh, it's around once. It's actually a pub sub protocol. Uh, you basically, you subscribe to a specific set of uh, blocks from other nodes uh, or other peers. And then your peers, when they get the block, if they get the block, will send you the block. There have been some additions onto this protocol where like that, that is why we got the sort of 20x overhead because like if we say, hey, everyone give me the block when you get it and then everyone gets the block, they give it to you, it's not great. Um, now, uh, basically you like, you can also say, actually just tell me when you have the block. Um, which, this is what we call a want have. So you send a want plus a have bit saying, please just tell me when you get the block, but don't give me the block when you get it. Um, this is how you can sort of like do some content routing, but it's again, pub sub, so you basically subscribe to notifications about the block. Um, the, the other bit we can set now is don't have, where you, it's kind of actually a request response oriented uh, protocol here, where like you say, hey, I'm interested in this block, but please immediately tell me if you don't have it so I can go ask someone else. Otherwise, if you just like, it, this lets you not just ask everyone up front, lets you sort of like, like take one round trip to ask some peers that you think have it, and if they don't have it, they say, okay, fine, now I ask more. Um, so let's you reduce some work. So that, that's, that's kind of how it works. Uh, the, the other secret sauce of BitSwap is sessions. So it's this concept of like, if I ask for one block, this block is probably related, or the peers that have this block probably have other related blocks. The, the tricky part of BitSwap is unlike GraphSync, we don't have any knowledge of the graph. We don't know what blocks are related to other, so we aren't traversing it. Instead, the, the, uh, the user is just asking for one block, another block, another block, sort of like, like all along. Um, uh, so, uh, so yeah, sessions basically let you group together requests uh, into a, sort of a single session. Um, uh, and then you can like correlate the peers in session and kick this clump of peers uh, uh, and say, okay, these peers seem to have related things. So when you get a new block in the session, you say one of these peers probably has it. So the way BitSwap currently works is you basically, like you'll, you'll receive, or go BitSwap, uh, you receive a request from a user uh, on a session. That session will then have a set of peers that have things related to that session. Um, uh, you'll then ask usually one of the peers uh, for the data, and then you'll act, like right now you'll actually ask all the other peers if they have it, so you send a want have to everyone else. Uh, in the future, we probably need to limit this. this is one of the problems of BitSwap, uh, we should ideally be broadcasting a lot less because right now we have to tell everyone we're interested in a lot of things, which like especially on gateways takes a lot of uh, CPU actually, and also takes a lot of bandwidth. This is also the reason why if you just join the, the IPFS network and you happen to connect to the gateway, you are sad because your you know, like your downstream actually gets saturated. Not saturated, but like, like it's heavily loaded by just like incoming requests from the DHT for data you don't have, or not DHT, sorry, from, from the gateway for data you don't have. Uh, but yeah, so th that's that's kind of how that stuff works right now. Um, that was a bit scatterbrained, uh, but I just wanted to give people a bit of an overview. Um, uh, yeah, 
I guess now I'll dive deeper a little bit into sessions. But like the way they're really supposed to work is uh, you start off with no peers. Uh, the first thing you do is to find who has the data. Um, right now, we ask everyone you're connected to. The assumption was that asking DHT was really slow. Asking DHT is now a lot faster. Uh, so, so what we probably should be doing is asking DHT first, or maybe asking like one or two peers that tend to be really, really, really useful. So that like ideally, we'd have some kind of side table that says like, hey, like these ten peers seem to be giving us a lot of stuff. It's kind of like the super session of everything, like of, like across all sessions. Uh, we could ask them first and then go to the DHT, but we shouldn't spam everyone because if you have 10,000 peers, just spamming everyone's not great. Uh, once you start, like, once you've found some peers that have that first piece of data you're looking for, then you can add them to your session. Uh, and now you start splitting requests between those peers. It's a smaller set. Um, uh, right, yeah. So right now, like, we ask one peer in that session for a block and then we spam, like, a one half to everyone else. Ideally, we'd, we'd spam the one half to a few peers, but not everyone. Uh, uh, we also actually have this interesting mechanism that I want to make sure people know about where like when someone gives you data or really any message, they gossip how much data they have queued for you. We are currently not using this, this mechanism, but it was actually a nice mechanism to like figure out how heavily loaded your peers are, at least in terms of like how much data they have to send to you. And like you can try to like, keep everyone's queues slightly full. So like an ideal bits of implementation would uh, like basically look at all of your, your peers or say look at all the, yeah, the, the peers in a session and find a peer that does not have data queued to you and like prefer sending wants to that peer. Um, uh, because like ideally, if you can sort of like keep this number from ever hitting zero, uh, then basically you're, you're, you're maxing out all of your peers and that's the optimal uh, strategy. Um, yeah, that is kind of what I wanted to say. Uh, who has questions on BitSwap? Anything you want to discuss? Anything that doesn't work? Anything that works? Yep. Can you speak to um, like adding more peers to the session? Perhaps peers that uh, don't have Yep. Uh, enough of the, the tree, and then you have to add more. And yeah. Yes. Like, so, yeah, so, so the way this currently works is uh, if, let's see, um, uh, periodically, regardless, we will just broadcast random wants to everyone. Uh, again, this is not efficient. We should be a little more careful about who we send these wants to. Um, uh, but that's one way we add peers. So, like, this is just so we can like add parallelisms. Like, if we're not down, if we're not basically not maxing out our bandwidth. Well, not even if we don't even check that. Basically, like to, to ensure that we max out our bandwidth, we constantly try to add more peers to the session by just occasionally broadcasting a random want. Um, we also have a mechanism where we say if the, the session is empty, then we broadcast things to everyone. Um, uh, so, so that, that's how we, we we fix that. We also have a mechanism actually that I forgot to mention, where like the session has peers that are related to the content you're looking for, but if a peer keeps on returning don't haves or just timing out, we add them to the bad peer list for the session. And we stop asking for them, them for things. So basically, like your, your session has this good peer list and the bad peer list. And once it, well, I'm not sure if it still has the bad peer list. I think it won't have had that. Maybe now we just kick them out entirely. But basically, we will remove peers from the active list of peers in your session when they stop giving you data, uh, either by timing out or by, because like we do actually have a, like, so like if I ask you, a, if I send you a don't have, uh, sorry, a request for a don't have, and you don't give it to me some period of time, I just say, okay, you timed out whatever. Um, and I, I treat that as I don't have. So when I ask you for data and you don't have that data, what, what do you do? Do you go to it, other peers and ask them for the data? Uh, what do I do? What do you do? What, what do you do? I, I don't. So you ask me for the data, I don't do anything. Okay. Uh, yes, I, yeah. So well, it depends. Like if you ask me for a don't have, I send you the don't have. If you don't ask for the don't have, so like, for example, when I send people like a want have, I generally don't also ask for a don't have. I just say, hey, Tell me when you have this thing. Don't tell me anything until then. Um, the final message we actually have is cancel. So you can say, I'm not interested in this block at all anymore. Uh, we need to be like, right now we have a fair amount of bandwidth spent on cancels. Part of the, a, lot, a large portion of this is because we send a lot of wants to peers where we don't need, need to send wants. If we sent fewer of those wants, then we'd send fewer of the cancels. Um, uh, we probably also want to be better about batching up cancels. Before we wanted to send cancels as fast as possible uh, uh, because cancels were like, like they would step, stop data from coming to us. Nowadays, like cancels are often just stopping want halves and, and stuff like that from coming to us because like we try to only ask one peer for the block. So we probably need to get better about like batching that data. Although we do actually, have, especially like in Go in uh, GoBitSwap, we have a very large mechanism around like batching out wantless messages. Uh, where, like we sort of collect the next message uh, and then once we we waited some delay, we send it out. Um, yeah. 
How, how often do you run into the situation that you don't have the block at the beginning, but then you somehow find it and then you can send it to me? So if you don't do anything to, to actively search for that block, it seems like a very unlikely event. So this is this is specifically designed for like the the, the bit swap swarm situation or Filecoin. Um, so like uh, in the BitSwap swarm situation, like you have a bunch of clients downloading data at once, uh, or a bunch of peers. Uh, ideally, you would all connect to all the peers that are downloading this data, and uh, like so, one of them might have data right now, but they don't have the other data, uh, and then eventually, ideally, they get the data and they send it to you. Sessions, the way they currently work, actually kind of mess with this a little bit because like if you start seeing this peer doesn't have the data, they go kick them out of your session. Uh, we probably need uh, like ideally, we would sort of have like people who have like. Ideally, be sending wants to all peers that are like related to the session, but haven't been giving us useful data. Or sorry, want haves, just not wants, uh, just to see if they ever have it. I, again, I don't actually know how this currently works, but ideally, that's how that would work. Um, uh, yeah. The other the other thing here is for uh, uh, message propagation to the network in Filecoin, because like the way that works is uh, uh, or block propagation. Basically, what, what I do is like if I mint a block, I publish it on PubSub, um, and then everyone else uh, who's connected to me. Uh, will then try to retrieve the messages over BitSwap. Um, uh, but the nice thing about this system is that like, uh, you kind of, you get this overlay graph from the PubSub network, uh, and then the, the BitSwap messages get lazy, or sorry, the messages get lazily pulled over BitSwap, and they kind of follow the graph from PubSub. Uh, uh, but what can happen here is like, that means like, um, the, the, but basically the messages, they're like one step behind, but only one step behind. So like, because like my, my uh, uh, block header goes out to my, my peers, my peers will then immediately ask me for the messages. Uh, I may not have the messages though yet because I may be pulling it from somewhere else. Uh, but the second I pull them, then I will say, "Oh, my peers are interested in these messages. Let me, or sorry, yeah, in the messages. Let me forward them to uh, to my peers." Uh, so like it, it creates this kind of overlay graph where like PubSub is has a lot of duplication where it sends data to like, multiple part to parties multiple times. Uh, BitSwap has a lot, a lot less, so that's the nice thing about using BitSwap here. We can have this push and then pull system. Uh, uh, where you can get deduplication. The other part about messages is like uh, we like um, generally peers in the network will already have some of the messages because they've already received them from PubSub. This is mostly for like pulling out all, or pulling the messages you don't have. BitSwap is really good for that kind of stuff. It's actually switching over to another topic where like um, uh, one of the nice things with BitSwap and why I said like it's kind of this magical protocol is like if I have some some directory tree on my computer in, in IPFS and then I modify something and I create a new directory tree. Uh, if I'm using any other uh, transport protocol, like I have to worry about duplicate data and stuff like that. Like I'm trying to download the new tree in BitSwap, I just start downloading. If I already have it, I stop there. Um, in like in a lot of protocols, I would have to like say, oh, please download the diff between A and B, um, or I would have to say like uh, uh, download A and then oh, quickly cancel all these other things that I already have. Um, but with BitSwap, it just works. What's the do you know about the relationship between the different I have not seen the Rust one. Uh, I, I think JavaScript now has sessions. Actually, I don't know. Like, I, I know that they, like both of them. Yeah, you know. Okay. Yeah. So like the, the basically the problem is like BitSwap itself is a really simple protocol. Um, I, the the like, the complexity comes from all of the like heuristics and peer management and sessions and all this kind of stuff, um, which. It's a blessing and a curse. It means that, like, if you implement it the stupid way, um, it's going to be really simple, but it's going to be really inefficient. But on the other hand, it means that, like, you can keep the protocol really simple, so anyone can just make an implementation even if it's really inefficient, and then slowly add more features to make it more efficient. It also means that, like, the server side is really, really easy to implement if you're just implementing a basic version because, like, someone tells you they want something, you give it to them. But you do have some state management here because it is it is a pub sub protocol. It's not a, a request response oriented protocol, so like, you do have to keep track of what they are looking for. Uh, uh, at least you should. Um, uh, like we also have other like block fetch protocols uh, that try to be more request response oriented or graph sync. Do you do you have to like you, you should not have to care, right? Like if you choose to like at some point block the You can. It's not nice, but yes, you can. So like if you don't want to, like there are some people in this room have implemented this. Um, uh, yes, you, you can just say like, do I have it now? No, I don't care about you. Uh, so like yes, you could probably implement this in like an AWS Lambda or whatever, where like you spin up an ephemeral node, check see if you have something, and then if you don't, shut down. Can you, you mentioned that the protocol is more like pub sub. What are the trade offs there? It seems like in practice it's mostly like request response. Right? Where I you ask for something and then you expect something back where you tell them. Yes, it, it is. But the the the, the, the nice thing about it being 
truly pub sub uh, is that like it it just makes it more magical. So like the problem is like like if it is purely uh, request response, uh, then I have to keep on going around and asking and asking and asking and asking, um, uh, and like I, I, data won't just flow through the network. Um, and like quite often, what I'll do is say like, oh, you don't have it. I'm gonna mark that you don't have it, so I don't ask you again. Uh, and like, we usually do that uh, because like I like basically when I ask you the first time, I'm gonna record that you don't have it. Um, so like th th that's why it's really useful to like to have it being like uh, request response or sorry like pub sub because it means that like no matter what our construction is, no matter how the data is flowing network, I will probably get the data eventually. Uh, the other way to do this is to just keep on asking. Uh, uh, like as long as I'm interested, I just keep on sort of like going around a circle. But that can get like inefficient, especially in situations where you don't know where the data is. I just want to share one thing that I say a lot, which is that build it soft is not an implementation of the build. Uh, it is partly an implementation of the soft protocol. It's mostly a, a giant library for making fancy for for making smart decisions about. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So BitSwap, the network protocol, is this teeny tiny little thing. Uh, ninety percent of it is sessions, and a little bit of it is this decision engine side, like what blocks to send and to manage want lists on the receive side. But it's honestly not hard to manage the want list on the receive side. The main problem we have right now is we don't have any back pressure on like how big these want lists grow. Um, that's something we definitely need to fix. But that's the one protocol change you really need to make there. It's another. It's like another Kubo thought. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, yeah. 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 The current assumption is that all trees are created equal. Well, as far as I understand, in the sense that if you do a parallel download with, say, you, four peers, you're trying to get. No. So you actually currently rank them by latency. Um, uh, yeah. And like the optimal strategy here is you rank them by latency. So the first few blocks go to the peers with the, the highest or the lowest latency. And then subsequent requests would go to the least loaded peers using their like using their, their queues. That's the ideal solution. Uh, so like like we basically we do have you know, we have some some stuff in there where basically we say we send a want at this time, uh, uh, and then we measure the amount of time it takes to get like a want have, um, and then we treat that as your latency. Uh, I think that's how we do it. Or do we use pings now? Do we use? I can't, I can't remember. Like I think initially it was want it was that kind of latency. I think now we might just use pings, uh, but, but I can't remember. Um, uh, but yeah. Is there anything about the bandwidth? Well, so I care about either latency or bandwidth. So when I'm caring about latency. Uh, then, like, yes, bandwidth, th that is a problem where, like, if I have one big block that I need to download, uh, but usually I either care about, like, a bunch of small little blocks, like, getting them very quickly, or I care about downloading a lot of data. Uh, with, like, w when I care about lots of data, what I, like, usually I just, I try to send it, basically, I try to even out how I send the data, the, uh, the, um, uh, the request to many peers, so that they all have something to send me, which ideally means that, like, peers that have more bandwidth will basically have more outstanding wants, because I try to fill their queue. Uh, so that's the idea where it's like, even if you're sm a small peer and you have low, low bandwidth, you're still like, I'm still maxing you out. Now, the problem there is if you have like a blocker or like if I'm asking a, a smaller peer for like an important node, uh, that that's not great. Um, right now we just have timeouts to deal with that. Where like if, if I have a timeout, then I go ask someone else. We don't have like, we, we do need better logic locally on the client uh, to deal with this. But this is where this whole like, we just need to rewrite a lot of this stuff comes from. Uh, where like, I, I we should have good, good client side logic where it says like, hey, Basically, I have one want left, uh, or I have fewer, fewer, fewer wants left. Um, I should broadcast these out to more peers because, like, it means they're probably a bottleneck somewhere. So the, um, the the logic that requires like the the thing that we benefit from the sort of the pub sub style, right, is mostly for for cases like when when the client is sort of already in a session. With the server, and the, the idea is that like the servers will be also getting the same sort of data because everything's downloading at the same time. Right? Yeah, it's not just from the server, it's from the other peers. Uh, yeah. But I, it feels like in order for this to kind of Fair make change. sense, you sort of need like, you, you might want like the server to have a session. Yes. Yeah, so yes. Because then all of this very much makes sense. Because then if yeah. you're like running offending servers, you're like, I don't have any session with anyone. Like, you know. Because I, I'm not planning on doing yeah, that so, if I'm running the... So it depends on, it depends on what you're doing. So like actually, like, like uh, the nice thing about message distribution in, in Filecoin is actually like that will sort of create that automatically because like you'll create this overlay graph from graph sync and that has its own peer exchange protocol built in. So like ideally you have these like, sort of clusters. Uh, this does not work in, in uh, yeah, like it just in general, we, we really do need server-side sessions and server-side peer exchange basically where like the server says, 
oh yeah, I've received these, like I've sent this block to other peers or like related blocks to other peers. Somehow it's kind of hard to do that, uh, but like it should be able to then tell you like, hey, here are some other peers you might be interested in. So basically like when, it, actually, honestly, like really when it sends you a block, it should also be able to say, hey, FYI, if you want in that block, here are some other peers that might be useful. Um, uh, so then you can add them to your session. That would be really nice to have, and that would really help this case. Like, the basic problem is we don't have swarming like we do in, in BitTorrent. Um, I've got a question about, <coughs> excuse me, the hash story. So uh, let's say that a peer, you know, receives once from multiple of its peers. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, you know, it's hub sub, and it's ready to notify whenever it hits the data that all of these other peers want. Um, how, do, how does BitSwap handle telling all of those peers that, like, if you get all of the data that all of your other peers want? Right? Mm -hmm. like a super hypothetical and probably rare situation, mm -hmm. but how is that situation handled? Uh, so when you get the data, we, we have this queue uh, locally that's like sort of like, or, sorry, like I keep track of your want list. Uh, whenever I get something, I look up in your want in it or in the want list, see if anyone's interested in it. If they are, uh, then I add a bunch of entries to the queue saying, I'm going to send this stuff out. And it's basically this big priority queue. Uh, and then based on, on that priority queue, we kind of like, we pull off, like basically we'll, we'll pull off the sort of the next peer in the priority queue, pull off a chunk of work uh, based on like a set of wants we want to send. We queue that for them, put the, 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 the peer back to the priority queue, pull off the next peer, that kind of stuff. So we kind of just work through this queue. We have a set of workers that just flush this data out to them. Uh, like the, currently we don't have great like, um, uh, like limits. Well, we have limits on this, but like the way we have it working right now is not great. Like you can, you can run to problems if you have some slow peers. Um, uh, but it usually doesn't overload you too much. The thing that actually overloads you usually is you, if you're making too many requests, not if you're receiving too many requests. Uh, under what circumstances does, does a session come into existence and when does it end? Ah. Is there any other one? Or there... So think of a session, it's, like, it's a context, it's a request. Uh, so like the, a session comes into existence when, like for example, like in, in Kubo, when the user comes to GoIPFS or Kubo uh, and says um, like, pin this thing or give me this file from Gateway or whatever. We internally, like in the command actually itself, will create the session. Uh, then we basically we treat that as a sort of a scope block store, uh, and then we make all of our requests through the scope. When we're done with the request, we throw away the session. Uh, in the future, I'd actually I really want to make this use context, uh, context, so we can use it elsewhere because like we really have a lot of other session information we need to like shove in here. Uh, but the idea is basically like you have a request, everything in that is related. You should now be able to start attaching additional metadata to this, including like peers that are useful for this request, um, content routing information that's useful paths you've resolved related to this request, the root of the request, all this kind of stuff that you can then use to like try to find the data and fetch it. So, so if you're given that you know, the session gets discarded, then uh, mm -hmm. does any, I guess it's up to the application if they want to somehow persist some of that information for the next session? We don't actually expose any way to do that. That is something that would be really nice. So one problem we actually have right now is like if you are visiting a website, um, the like, we really should have some kind of peer, like like user, or sorry, I guess, like client scope session, um, where like really the, the gateway should probably have something where it says, oh, like any requests related to this domain name or this whatever go into the session. We don't, or like basically domain name and user or something like that, or even just like user connection. I don't know how you would do this, but you have to have something like that. Right now we don't. Right now it's very much like we create the session, we destroy the session, whatever. It's not too bad because usually like you are still connected to those peers and the way it currently works is we broadcast everyone on the first request. So like then we'll just ask everyone again, we'll reform the session, but it's not great. Ideally we would still keep something, but yeah. So in the web UI, I, I really want to display some uh, better metrics about what's going on, mm -hmm. the data that you're sending and receiving, mm -hmm. what people are requesting. So um, just two, I guess, questions about the metrics, mm -hmm. um, I guess, uh, do you have a metric on the the um, delay between wants and haves? Like if a node then obtains data that it doesn't currently have and then delays between wants and haves, how many dropped wants or canceled wants? Or I don't think we keep metrics for any of that stuff. Most of our metrics are around like how much inbound and how much inbound we have per peer, uh, how big your want list is, uh, what your peers are wanting, that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, I don't know... If no, we don't really have any, like we don't expose at least. So like we do internally have some of the, these metrics, but we don't expose them. Those are great things to probably expose through like, uh, I guess for me to set points, um, but yeah. Okay, how would I go about working with? Uh, I mean, so like we already have a bunch of 
Prometheus endpoints. Uh, uh, yeah, you just add another one of those. Uh, it would expose like the trick. Yeah, I, I'm not entirely, like some of this information we have, some of this information is very much like we get it when we need it. Uh, so it's not necessarily some, I don't know actually, unfortunately. Yeah. You mentioned that it would be nice to have some sort of exchange of information about other peers. Does it's what app it is today exchange any information about peers or is that no, it's absolutely not part of it? It, it is absolutely not part of it. It doesn't, yeah. So this is actually a big hole right now uh, where like you need to find other peers through the DHT. Um, uh, which is really annoying because yes, like you talk to someone and they're serving you data, they can probably tell you who else can serve you data. Um, but we have no like, hey, you're looking for this thing related to this CID, are these peers, maybe you should connect to them. This also opens up a whole can of worms of like, please connect to this random peer. Um, uh, where like ideally what this would be is actually a, a signed provider record. So once we have signed provider records, then yes, that like I could ask you for data and the peer could just tell me like, and here are a set of provider records for this data as well, in case you're looking for related things, that would be the best solution. We can still probably, because of course none of this is signed right now, and the DHT will tell you to connect to random peers anyways, fine. It's probably fine to just like 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 take some optimistic data, and if you have some clear cycles, just say, no, I'll try one or two peers, but we don't really do any of that. It feels like my, my swarming, I think you, I guess you, you saw a little bit of this already, but like the swarming is a little bit hurt by the one have situation because <laughs> if I'm only sending one blocks to like one or two peers, then are they going to get like, I guess, the, rely on that one to get the data? No, the one halves do the same thing. So the one halves are still pub sub. Uh, so like when I send you a one half, you will then send me the have when you get the block. So it's like it's it's very much like um, like our, our like gossip sub basically. We're in gossip sub we have the same thing um, where like uh, you you receive eagerly you receive messages from some set of peers and then lazily receive gossip from other peers that tell you what messages you may have missed. It's the same kind of idea. Yeah. The problem with that though is it does mean like wants don't expire um, and maybe we should have some kind of expiring want. My concern there. This is what um, Frida was bringing up last night. Like, but my concern there is like, I, I don't want to keep on rebroadcasting. And right now we have to like constantly send. So it's kind of mm, not entirely sure. Um, uh, but, but yeah. Can you send it like, can I send my like PPL with the, with the one tab and you and the server can be like, I want less than that and just drop it and see if I can. You can. The problem there is like, okay, then you have to manage the details. Uh, and the fact that like, if you if you do want, if you have a want that's sort of sticking around for a long period of time, you have to keep on dealing with that. I think another way of doing this is kind of like delay. Like one, one piece of logic we could have is like, we could delay sending out cancels or things like that. Um, and then I could basically look at the my, Im my image of your want list and my version of the want list. And if they differ enough, I just basically send you the full want list. That's another way of doing this because that will implicitly cancel everything else. Uh, the other way to do this is maybe like assign IDs to want so that we can, actually it's probably a great way of doing this, we could assign IDs and we can send bits fields. And that would make this a lot simpler. Um, it does mean more state though. If, if I send you two want lists, is the current logic that they get merged? No, they, like, we, we, we have a flag that's full or not full and we have no way of ordering them. Uh, this is something man has proposed before as ways to fix this. Um, but we need some kind of like, especially in the first message on a stream or in all messages or whatever, we need some kind of ordering thing. Um, yeah. So right now it's a race condition. So right now, what's, what's the current heuristic? We just take the latest stream and we like, so like basically like, like we, so it's either full or not full. If it's, if it's not full, it'll have basically cancels and wants, and then we'll merge those. Um, uh, if it's a full want list, we replace your current want list with the full want list that you sent us. And you set a flag on your, on your request that says full or not full. Yeah, the order would be great, but again, like also actually bit fields would be nice. That would be really interesting because like right now it's like having to like say, oh, and cancel this one and now add this one or whatever. It's very robust, but on the other hand, it means you have to send you basically every CID twice and it doubles the amount of output bandwidth. Um, it would be nice to not do that. On the other hand, like I think that the main thing to, to resolve the output bandwidth problem is not that because like fine, doubling the output bandwidth is nothing compared to a thousand xing the output bandwidth by like talking to a thousand peers. 
Um, so like if we just broadcast a few of here's like the outbound bandwidth goes to nothing. Yep. If a right two sessions for the view, and they send you uh, so this is why BitSwap is super complicated. Um, because the way it actually works is you have a series of sessions. Uh, then you have a series of, of want lists, per peer, basically peer handlers. Uh, and so it's, it's a matrix, basically, where like, or I don't know what you can call it. Yeah, it's a matrix, I guess. Where like, you have your set of sessions, you have your set of want lists for peers, or your set of peers. Uh, the, the sessions will then basically like send wants to the local, sort of your local um, images of those peers. Um, effectively the facades, and then you basically say, oh, is this want already in the want list? If it is, don't send anything. If it's not, send something. Uh, so really what this, what this does is like, you effectively like, like when you ask for something in a session, you um, uh, like find the peers you have, you add it to their local want lists. Uh, if there is a change, you then add that to a diff of things to send to the peer. And then once after some timeout or once the diff is big enough or whatever, then you push the diff. Yes, yeah, it's global cross sessions for the peer. So every single, basically every session has a want list, every peer has a want list. And then you also have a broadcast want list that is the, the um, like the, the sum of all the broadcast wants from all the sessions. Um, so you kind of merge them together and deal with that. Uh, so th this is like, yes, so the, like, but this, no, this is client side. So honestly, this is a problem on the gateways because like your, your client side gateway or want list can get fairly large. On the server side, the amount of data you have to just actually store here is pretty minimal because usually like, Okay, you have like a thousand peers, something like that, at most, usually, or maybe five thousand peers, um, uh, and then like like hundreds of wants, something like that, for per peer. It's actually not so much data. Um, the server side, is, yeah, that's yeah. Side, yes, yeah. So well, this, yeah, yeah. This, this is this is one of the reasons we have problems. Um, we actually we have highly optimized this, so it's it's not as bad as it used to be. Um, uh, this is also one of the reasons why. Or one of the, the, the main reasons why we moved CIDs to be strings in Go, uh, because it means they can like basically we can create one CID once uh, and then re like like not have to duplicate the data. Um, it's, effectively, it's it's um it's basically like uh, interning, yeah. Uh, so that that saves us a fair amount. Um, so we, yeah, we try to be very careful that we also I mean PRIDs are also effectively interned, uh, so it, it saves us a fair amount there as well. Um, it, it's not great, but like the biggest problem actually on on clients uh, like the gateway is more just like locks and handling notifications of connects and disconnects. Uh, we now have a patch that, or we made a change that hopefully helps this a bit. Um, but yeah, like if you have lots of like, 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 cause the problem is whenever a DPR shows up, you have to send them everything that you broadcast, like your broadcast want list. Whenever PR leaves, you have to like do a lot of cleanup and deal with that. Um, and we also have like, we also treat a join and a leave whenever, basically whenever PR becomes uh, unresponsive, we treat that as a leave and whenever they become responsive, we say, oh, you're here again and we send them things again. Yeah, but there's a lot of improvements you need to make this logic to like debounces a bit. So um, earlier, you know that 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 you were just mentioning makes me think of having you know a, a singular queue for all the work that's necessary on a particular node. But um, I I wanted to ask about um, earlier you said that you're trying to make sure that your peers are like sending you as much data as possible. Like if they're if they're low, yes. you know, then they're not doing enough work, but how do we prevent them from doing, like, like doing work all of the time is great when you want that. Doing mm -hmm. work all of the time when you're just like starting up IPFS desktop. Oh, is this. Not necessarily great. So, yeah, no, sorry. This is only when you when you're looking for things. The point is like when you are asking for data, basically like you're in two modes. You're either in latency sensitive, where like you want like the first block or something like that really really fast, um, or you're in a mode where you're just trying to get as much data as possible as fast as possible. Uh, when you're like basically just the way you've seen it, it's like usually you're latency sensitive when you have a couple of blocks you're looking for, like one or two, because uh, that's like when you're traversing a path or you're downloading a blockchain or something like that, or like you're downloading a small file. In that case, like you find the lowest latency peer and you ask them, or ideally you ask multiple low latency peers. Uh, in the case where they're trying to download things as fast as possible, the thinking is that like you, you want every peer to be like maximizing the outbound bandwidth you, because that's that it basically means that you're maximizing your inbound bandwidth. Uh, so th that's, but w w otherwise, no, you don't talk to, like, well, right now you broadcast a lot, uh, but like, if you're looking for things, but if you're actually not doing, if you're not looking for things, you don't send anything, you're just quiet. But, but even when you're wanting that data and so you want to maximize throughput, yeah. right? How do, like me as a peer who may not know that you're trying to maximize throughput, mm -hmm. I'm impacted now. Like my internet but, connection is so, potentially impacted. What's, what's so so the, that's the server size problem. 
So basically, the, 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 the thinking here is like it's up to the server to decide what they want to send you and what they don't want to send you. Um, uh, so like the the like when I'm giving you data, um, I have a local queue and I can make prior decisions based on do I want to serve you, do I want to serve someone else. Uh, so the point is like like actually one of the goals here is to like we had this problem where like you might like. I don't want you as a client to keep on sending me a bunch of additional wants and CIDs if I'm not sending you anything. Uh, so like that was the idea behind adding this extra number of like, how much data do I have queued to you? So like I can tell you, hey, I already have this amount of data queued to you. There's no point in you sending me any additional wants. Now, this is not perfect. We need back pressure. So last night, last night we were talking about this. We're like, I would like some way for me to like tell you, hey, like you can now send me 20 more wants um, or have some kind of like maximum wants. Maximum wants are hard to track because like, you don't actually know how many wants I'm really tracking for you right now. There's no real guarantee there, and it's an async protocol. Uh, a simpler way of doing this is to like, like basically, I can then send you a window and say, you now have 20 more wants, 20 more tickets. You can then send me 20, 20 wants, and then like, or basically, you send me 10 wants, and then I say, and now you have 20 more or whatever, something like that. Um, uh, we like, we don't currently, like, yeah, this is it's still a bit tricky because I want to make sure we don't have too much back and forth. Like, if you're just sending me a bunch of wants, I don't want to have to like, keep on sending you these tickets. But the tickets are pretty small, and like. It, like, okay, fine, one packet once in a while is not bad. So like, as long as I batch it up in time, it's probably fine. But we don't do that. Thanks. We like to it, though. Couldn't we do this a little bit differently where we just, you just send once, basically, and then I'll just send you a message back of like, hey, I'm, I'm good, I'm stopped. And uh, then we just can use Zoom. You could, you could have back, active back questions. The problem there is like, it, it, no. The problem is like, if everyone's overloaded, that doesn't work. And like, so the problem with stuff like that is you get cascading failures where like, like you're sending me lots of wants, I'm now overloaded, um, uh, or or you're overloaded because you're doing lots of work, and like so like now my message back to you to like tell you to stop gets blocked up on something or it takes time, and now you take time processing that message to so keep sending me wants. I also have the problem with that is like I have no way of knowing if you got the message or when you got the message, so. But it's it's, it's optimistic, right? I'm sending you stop and I'm starting dropping your wants immediately. But but that's not great. So the problem is like if I start dropping your wants immediately or I, like like then like you don't know what I've actually accepted. Um, uh, so like it gets it, the nice thing about having like more like like you request like basically not you request but like like I, I tell you when you can send more is like we've now agreed on how much I'm willing to give you. Um, uh, like yes, you could have a back an active back off, but like I prefer making it so that like like basically if no one talks, no one can talk kind of situations where like like if you have something where like you have to tell someone to go away, um, then it's like there are cases where that's really useful, but I really prefer to make it so that like. Like by default, like you fail quiet, I guess. Um, otherwise, like when you start like getting overloaded, you then have to like do additional work to unload things and it's not great. Um, and I don't think there'll be too much extra bandwidth. Like, is you're sending me lots of wants um, uh, and I actually have to keep on sending, like, and I'm basically, if I'm going to send you another one of these, like, oh yeah, you can send me more wants, chances are I've already sent you some blocks. Like I'm gonna be sending you blocks as well. Uh, otherwise I'm not gonna want more wants from you usually. So it's probably just gonna get piggybacked. So one of our key things coming out is that is really pushing around specs and mm -hmm. uh, yeah, etc. I'm used to the, the uh, improving process that we've been putting in place. So I, I know that like Dean's has been working on updating the the spec for I don't know, I'm curious about where that's at and then like what aspects outside of the spec like sessions etc. we want to get standardized or common conventions on. Yeah, the sessions are truly a spec right now um it, it's very very much like an implementation thing but that, that should be there should be like see implementation notes that describe these different systems um uh yes i would like that to happen uh, right now i'm, I'm not focused on that sure, yeah, uh I'm yeah forward, like, what do we ideally want to see like, obviously we want an accurate spec to the yeah protocol, so and i think that's the last time that needs to get like picked over the finish line and they keep the for finding bugs for me um the one thing I, I, I do want to be careful of is like the prior the prior slash existing version in the spec repo of the bit swap spec um, has two issues. One is that it doesn't refer to the latest version of bit swap, but the other is that like it basically describes like the whole it describes like the whole go bit swap operation from that time period, which is like not a spec, mm -hmm. right? It makes it like very difficult to understand like what it is you have to do. And so being able to like separate the pieces of like, here's what you need to do, here's what you may want to do to make it go fast. If you're smarter than me, this is where you can start being smarter than me. <laughs> right? Um, so yeah, like 
I, there's an interesting question around there. Like, implement deta implementation details, I agree, should not live in the spec. I think they should live in the repo, maybe, for our, our for like their first implementation, but they need to be there and they need to be updated because there's so many lessons like that are learned already. And if you like it, it so so like I it, and interestingly, BitSwap itself secretly has like a big nice here's how a bunch of things are working in the repo. But that's not what? I'm pretty sure that is that's always out of date. Well, okay, it, 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 so it doesn't, uh, yes, but also it can be kept up to date if people are committed to it. And, and like, um, and that one is way more up to date than what's in the spec, which is like, from, I think like, David has put it in there like five years ago, like, but, it's not very I but, just wanna... Well, I'm saying like, I think that the spec, like, it really, the spec itself should actually have some notes around this stuff. Like, it should be the core spec is like, this is the protocol, but then there should also be the like, and this is how you should implement sessions. This is how you should do these things. Uh, and this is how this how basically how the protocol should be used. Where it's not must, but it still should. I, I just want to say that just because something may not may be an implementation detail for one spec does not mean that implementation cannot itself be a spec. So, like you can combine and uh, compose specs to build a system. Mm -hmm. So. Like holding it in sessions could be a modification spec to the bit swap spec. Is that as good? Is that what we want? Like, I, yeah, I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, something we found a lot of success with is putting in a spec or linking out the document with uh, implementer recommendations. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's been very helpful. Yeah, I, I think in this case it's a little more than just implement. Like, it's very much like, and here are all like there are all these weird things that we give you. This extra information we give you. How do you actually use this? Because like from this the spec, it's like well you have these want have and want flags, and you have this extra information like telling you how much data someone has queued for you. Like no idea how you should actually use the information. It's extra bits. Uh, this one was all about like the the metadata and figuring out how to do things. My sense is right now that given your description and given the if you look at the raw protocol description that Adib is working on, is that the diff is too large right now, in a sense that I think the spec does need to include more than the raw protocol description. Because the problem is, yes, you can just implement a very dumb thing, which just, just request response things, yeah. throws away everything else. Uh, it works, but it makes basically everybody else's life for a better implementation worse, because, and, but you don't know. Yeah. Because the spec doesn't tell you, the spec just tells you, if you can ask for stuff, you get stuff back. And so I think that we need to expand that a little bit more on how do you, how should you deal as a client, how should you deal as a server? And mm -hmm. it's maybe not a must, maybe, yeah. maybe you should or something like that. But but I think this means like there's a core protocol spec that just tells you this is how the protocol works, this we must do. And then there's the like, and this is how you should implement your client. Yeah. Well, yeah. I don't know, like nobody else does this. Like we need the BitTorrent specs. They're like, but then you have to read the BitTorrent client they're, implemented. They're like very reasonable, and then they tell you like, they're like, here, here is where we added some, we added some variables that allow you to like send metadata. This is why the metadata things were added. Same implementation should consider X, Y, Z, and descendants, right? But, but, yeah. Wait, okay. well, it could be a little more than that. Like, so, so, so the IPS totally does that. that there are schemes that are like, purely like operational considerations or protocol end. So I, I think it's, it's a good idea to have a second document where you just draw it like, okay, yeah. sessions are a good idea, but here's what you need to think about. Yeah. Also, like, that drove me crazy when I was working at BitTorrent. I really wanted to be like, well, BitTorrent works. I want to know what they're doing. <laughs> and it's nowhere. Like, there's like a, you can learn about their like little trap algorithm with the, where they turn on and off peers, um, but like, it's probably five years out of date, you know, like, and, and anyway, the, the I, I think that uh, where, where I think we, wherever it lives, doesn't need to be in a spec, just capturing lessons learned over many years of development on this protocol, so is useful for people. Yeah, so you don't have to go call Steve every time you like. Yeah, you should have fly Iceland. <laughs> oh, I, know. I mean, if we have to fly to Iceland to ask Steve a question, I think we're all okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> this is on Stephen. Stephen actually is the person you should always ask questions about. Because no one else. Was.
Does yeah. anything about it? He likes it. All future people watching this video. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully by the time they watch this, we will have more implications of bit swap or rewrites. But yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I think the, the core takeaways I have from this is like, um, uh, yeah, okay, we need better spec uh, that actually, like one, fully specifies the protocol, two, specifies in a separate document or wherever all of the, the, um, the extensions, like how it's supposed to work. We also, like we do, like before I was saying no vertical changes, like become more confident we do need some, or basically like, the main ones are, we need some way to order um, uh, like wantless between different streams. So some kind of number on, on at least on the stream itself or on the full diffs. We need uh, a, like, we might want to consider some way to more efficiently cancel, with, for example, bit field, something like that. Um, uh, we definitely need some kind of back pressure on wantless sizes uh, so that like I can like, have some default, like no, every peer gets like 10 wants and then I can decide what I want, where I want to go from there. Um, uh, and then we also need some kind of peer exchange where like rescue servers can say, hey, here's, your, here's the thing you're looking for. And by the way, here are some related peers that you should probably like add to that session. Cool. Yeah.